What's up, guys? Today's guest is singer-songwriter James Bourne. He is a huge inspiration of mine. Incredible singer-songwriter of the band Busted. He wrote the year 3000, which was also used for Jonas Brothers. We get into that in the conversation. He was in another rock band called Son of Dork. He wrote a musical called Ticket Out of Loserville. So if you like the podcast, please give this video a like. Comment down below who else we should reach out to and who we should get. Make sure to subscribe, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with the rock star, James Bourne. What's up, Lightweights Podcast? Today we have James Bourne, lead singer, songwriter of the rock band Busted. They sold over 5 million copies and they are currently underway for their next tour. The band Busted has achieved four number one singles, won two Brit Awards, sold out Wembley Arena 11 nights in a row. They've released four studio albums, sold over 5 million copies, and their band was so big that they were cited as the reason for an increase in guitar sales. Ladies and gentlemen, James Bourne. Yeah, I remember that. That was uh, Christmas 2002. No, yeah, Christmas 2002 or three. I think it was two. Uh, I went into, you know, the place, which, by the way, is closed now, which is really kind of heartbreaking because I bought all my stuff from there. And um, as I walk in, you know, it's a place called PMT. Uh, it was in... South End High Street, just off of South End High Street. And as I walk in, there are these two guys. I, c I could never really, I could never really figure out if they were brothers or if they were related, but they were interesting characters. And, you know, they were always there. And I walk in and one of them points at me as I walk in. And he, just, you know, the band is like having its first big Chris like, you know, we've been big in since September our first song we hadn't released year 3000 yet but maybe it was on I think it might have been on the the like MTV already um and we go in and the guy points at me and he goes you <laughs> <laughs> you're the reason we're selling so many guitars because like that year it was like you know like every Christmas like one year Buzz Lightyear was the thing and Every, every Christmas there was a thing. And that Christmas, it was just guitars. Um, and they were like, yeah, I think a lot of this is just down to busted. And and so that was kind of interesting to at, see that effect, yeah. At the time you guys released it, guitars weren't necessarily as much on the radio, being in a rock band. They weren't on the it wasn't like It wasn't at all. I mean, obviously, like you had, you know what it was? In, in the 90s, obviously, you had like Blur and Oasis, and they were real bands. But there was sort of a different lane for those bands. Those bands were marketed down this, you know, real music lane. And then there was sort of a different lane for pop music that things like um, in the 90s, like like the end of the 90s, things like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and all of the copycat boy bands in England. Um, you know, there was there was an avenue for like, I guess, more of a record company generated thing and we definitely were pushed down that lane but that lane kind of hit uh like i think a wider audience um that necessarily wasn't used to the guitar thing at all um and we would show up to play you know, radio shows with a lot of other bands and there would be nobody uh, playing guitar. It would all be just a bunch of people that had their act that was like, we're singing to a track and we, you know, we don't, we don't have a band. We don't, there's no drummer, there's nothing. They were just like, like karaoke almost, like people with mics. Um, and we would show up to these shows and there was just kind of a big change after that. Like people just kind of felt like, you know, people would stand and they would watch us do our thing and they would be like, oh, I guess this is where where it's going because we would get a good response to all these things. And as the band got bigger and built an audience, I think people looked to us in the pop world as, you know, a band that was making the guitars um, relevant to like that market. You know, because at that time too, you were twenty years old, twenty one. Uh, but yeah, well, younger, like probably nineteen at that point. Were you able to see this is your way in because no one else was doing it? I didn't really look at it like that because you know, we liked Blink One Eighty Two and 
we liked um you know i always and, and i i liked oasis when i was like young and i liked nirvana and green day and i liked those bands but i also liked you know boy bands i didn't have a problem with the backstreet boys i thought their songs were amazing and i thought nsync was amazing so i never really had i didn't really go into the music thinking I have to be this way or has to be seen this way. I was just sort of happy that I was not having to go to college. You know, I was like, <laughs> my, 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 like, my whole thing was like, I just don't want to go to college. Yeah. That was my biggest thing. Uh, and, you know, I guess I used whatever musical songwriting ability I had to escape a normal life. It was like, I don't want to go and work in a normal place. I want to do something that excites me. I want to do something that's fun. And if that meant, you know, if, if, if busted had been an all singing, all dancing boy band, that would have been good enough for me. Yeah. I would, you know, I would, I would have taken that. It's just that we, I think what we stood for was, you know, we wasn't really, we never really intended or planned for it to be that way. But I think that we, we ended up standing for something that was really valuable um, for younger people that looked up to our band. You know, because we had a lot of young fans that were young teenagers, like y like thirteen year olds, you know, twelve year olds, young and and you know, like people that um, come up to me still today, and they 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 say like how much of uh, a big effect, you know, the band had on them wanting to do music or learning an instrument or, and that's amazing stuff, um, but, you know, I was just you know grateful that. I was doing music, you know. What was the first time like when people would come up to you asking for your autograph, trying to take pictures with you? Uh, it's actually quite, it's actually quite, uh, quite weird. And um, you know, like the first person, the first time you get asked for a picture, you hang around like for way too long with the person. <laughs> <laughs> what else can <laughs> I do like, for you? <laughs> yeah, 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 like you, you just, you know, you just kind of, you write like an essay on the thing and. <laughs> <laughs> you like you take like five pictures from different angles and and um you're just so stoked that that's happening yeah um and then uh you know obviously it's always like you know and then it's not that doesn't happen really like all the time it happens if we're doing something or we're in the zone with the band or if we're on tour then obviously all the time right um but rarely still i mean even out here like i do get a few people they i'm surprised i'm shocked at like what they know because you forget that when you put music out it's forever kind of um like it's weird that you know about my other band son of door yeah it's weird that you know that like when, when i'm always surprised when people know that but you know we did have like a little bit of a moment too but it was very um it was very like overshadowed by you know when you're in a band like busted and um, you know, ended very suddenly. Uh, you know, the three of us, we all got record deals afterwards because the band was that successful. And, um, you know, we we all could do really whatever we wanted with, with that record deal. I could have done whatever I wanted, whatever kind of project I wanted to do. And I loved being in the band so much, I just wanted to do another band. Um, and which was... Uh, which probably wasn't the best idea, you know, because um, the dynamic of having been in Busted and then being in a new band with four new people, so it was even more band members. Um, I think I was on a major, like, Newfound Glory hype at the time, and I just wanted to create more of a bigger, like, five-piece band. Or even, I probably would have made it a six-piece if they would have let me. Um, but like, who says stop now? Like, it's too much member. <laughs> and I just did. I like did it. I didn't care. I was just like, no, it's gonna be like newfound glory. Um, but um, I think it just ended up being uh, sort of like you know something that kind of the songs kind of resembled busted a little bit because I was writing them, but it wasn't because it wasn't you know, it wasn't the three of us. It was this new band, so. Um, but you know, it's funny cause you know, the album actually did well, kind of, but I think it wasn't well enough for the record company to be excited for it to keep on going. And my relationship, we did tour, we did keep touring for a little bit, but my relationship with 
uh, the other guys in the band, I don't think uh, was strong enough with all the members for me to want to like, I don't know, at that point I was so tired, you know, it'd been like a lot of years and I kind of just wanted to travel and come to America and live in New York and come to Los Angeles more because we came here with Busted and also with Son of Dork, you know, we did a lot of sessions and I made a lot of friends during that time and and it was fun, you know, I just wanted to come back and with n with nothing in my schedule and just relax a little bit. When you had Son of Dork, I remember it was a roller coaster for me because I was craving new music and I found Busted. <laughs> right. And I was so stoked and I found two albums <coughs> and then I dove into it and I found out you guys just broke up. Then I found out you had Son of Dork and I was thrilled. And then I found out Son of Dork was ended. But then I started following your whole journey and I remember it was at the time we had a mutual buddy and he was doing a show with this band All-Star Weekend. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned how I love this UK band and he asked who it was. I said, Busted. And I said, Son of Dork. He's like, that's James Warren's band. I'm like, yeah. He's like, we need him to sign some contracts with us. I'm like, shut up. He's like, he's in New York right now. I'm like, you're lying. Then we ended up going out to lunch with you and we went to MoMA together the very next day. And I got to hang out with you the entire day. And I was just on cloud nine. This was in New York. New York, yeah. like 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I love New York. Um, you know, I, like I've had like such an insane life, like living in New York. And um, I'm really I, I would like to go. I would like to spend more time in New York. But um, I remember that day, I think. Um, because this was with All Star Weekend. Yes. Yeah. They were doing the Walmart sound check. That's right. Yeah, because um, it's crazy how I came into like contact with with that band because um, you know there was a three piece band, and Tom Norris was in it. Yep. Do you remember that? That was before I met them. Right. He was away. I knew. Of right. Him. Because because Tom is still a friend of mine. And I could not I, like I actually feel like I got to I got to witness some majorly amazing stuff with them because I was boarding quite early because they wanted to write a song like Year 3000. <laughs> and we wrote the song Journey to the End of My Life, which I feel like is uh, kind of like a new song modeled on Year 3000, just the way the structure of it and and everything. And. Tom was this band member, but he was recording their demos. But he was recording their demos on a laptop that had missing keys. Oh, and my gosh. Like, like lying on the floor, not even sitting at a desk, like lying on his like stomach on the floor. Like just like with, I'm thinking, how does he not have like a desk or how how is he doing that? How is he able to make this song sound like that? I could I'd never seen anything like it. I was I was I I thought the band was amazing but and and all the members were super easy to get on with but I just couldn't stop wondering how this 16-year-old kid had this like capability to make something sound like it could go on the radio with no equipment. I mean it I guess it's you know it's not it's not the wand, it's the wizard, right? right? And that's, he's like, it was like proof of that. He, and I was like, this is not normal. And um, he actually got, I think got kicked out of the band. I can't remember what happened with him. Something like that. Something like that. He, you know, he was destined for something else because, you know, he just had this amazing uh, talent to make things sound good. And I think it was like, I, like years and years went by after he like went out the band and I reached out to him on Facebook. This was when I was doing Mook Busted at this point. And I said to him, hey, man, what are you doing? Please, what, how are you doing? What are you doing these days? Please tell me it's music. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's music. I'm um, doing some music stuff. I was like, oh, great. And then he starts telling me what he's working on. And, you know, it's like, yeah, Rihanna, um, I'm doing, uh, you know, like the biggest stuff in the world, Isn't basically. They have a Taylor Swift cut, too. Well, I'm probably he's done everything. He did that. <laughs> he did that. He, 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 he mixed the Lady Gaga 
song for Top Gun. Unreal. And um, that was like just recently. And it's like so crazy that uh, I saw him start out where he was um, working on that song together, you know, uh, for the band that he would eventually not be in, but he would go on to have this, you know, amazing uh, career. So I think, and, and actually it's funny because like people want to talk about, like when I do interviews, like, and people ask about Busted or they ask about, uh, some people want to talk about Son of Dork. Some of the stuff that's happened, like in like the 10 years, really between Son of Dork and McBusted happening when I was just out here doing stuff. Those are the, those are some of the craziest stories, you know, because um, I was sort of like, involved in so many things that like behind the scenes you know not really as a front fronting band member um where i would you know i think with that band i got involved to the point where i was even i was just sort of like helping them like with everything it wasn't like i was you know i was on the street with them handing out flyers the day that they uh, got the disney radio break you know and um you know, we would go and we would hand flyers out, you know, uh, at Jonas Brothers events, <laughs> which was like, which, which, was, which was like, which was like crazy. Because yeah. now, obviously, you know, everything's come full circle and we've just released the song with Busted and the Jonas Brothers because there was that connection with, um, with Year 3000. And, um, it's just really wild, all of the things. I mean, you remember, and even after All Star Weekend, there was that other band that my brother was in. Hollywood Ending. Yeah, and I and like like I was around for some of that when they would tour on on the West Coast. You brought them out with you too. Well, that was later on. Right. Yeah, but I'm talking about like before I knew that I would be in a band again, because because I didn't think that I would, and I was almost just like I don't know, like an uncool, you know older brother that happened to be in their bus or on you know and not not two of us like school of rock minivan 15 passenger <laughs> yeah, exactly. white van yeah, exactly. broken down tire yeah <laughs> yeah and and i remember like we were somewhere in, we were somewhere in anaheim at like seven in the morning and i don't know wh why it was so early or what the reason was but we were in anaheim and we were driving around some back streets looking for where we were going and um they were just like right in the middle of the grind of being on tour like venues like house of blues and those kinds of places and one direction is sort of like starting to really happen and they're like oh it'd be so good to like get on a one direction tour and i'm thinking oh maybe i know someone who knows someone that can like make a connection for them and you know, I'm trying to figure out who it is that I can call and uh, fast forward, not even, not even that long, maybe three years, like we're on, t I'm on tour with One Direction, like in Australia. And it was just like, um, you know, with, with my band <laughs> and I'm thinking that there is no way that I could have predicted that, you know, because the, because the, because the, the resurgence of, of, of getting back to Busted by way of, you know, this kind of um, like amalgamation band with McFly, which was an, another thing. It's like with McFly, it was like the beginning of that band. I was very involved in, uh, in the songs and everything. And um, it just was like a crazy, it was a crazy story because in those years, in, in, in those sort of nine years that I was, it's like the best part of a decade. I was really just, I had sort of accepted that as an artist, it was finished for me. Does that make sense? Yeah. I did not think that I would do uh, anything again, like on that level. And so I'd sort of resorted to writing musicals and writing songs for other people and uh, gravitating just, towards people that creatively inspired me, you know, just to make music, not even to release it, just to make it. And um, to be back in a place where, you know, to be touring at this level now and to be, 
you know, doing the things that I'm doing now, I just feel like unbelievably grateful for it. You know, was that hard for you to accept in your mind at that time? <sighs> you know, it wasn't hard to accept, but I had accepted it. It wasn't like I, I, I thought, oh, well, I've had enough fun to last me forever anyway. Like I've had enough fun to last me a lifetime. You know, I've, I would have been happy with just the first round stuff, you know. Um, so it wasn't, no, and it wasn't really that hard. It was, but it was unbelievably like refreshing for me when it came back. Um, and I did not expect it. So you announced your comeback with Busted. Yeah. You guys sold 100,000 tickets in the first hour saying that Busted was doing another tour. Yeah, I mean, what's weird is that now there's actually been two comebacks because, um, so I don't actually know what one you're talking about. I think in 2016, right? Or 2017? Yeah, yeah. That was the first one. Now you just told me you have another tour coming up, sold out. Yeah. 200,000 tickets sold in the UK. Yes, bananas yeah it's crazy from the outside perspective you're saying that you never thought you'd have that chance again but from my perspective i'm always like when are they coming back yeah no i never thought we would i didn't think we would um <laughs> it's wild yeah you mentioned on a previous podcast when you found out that moment that busted had a chance of coming back together the original trio mm -hmm. what was that feeling when you heard those words Sorry, what was this when I, this is when I spoke to Charlie. Yes. Yeah. The day of the Mick, Mick Busted concert. That's right. Yeah, that was the first time. Well, he had already, well, there were a couple times where we had, Matt and I had maybe an opportunity to do something, just the two of us. And we figured, well, if he never wants to do it again, it would be a shame to never play those songs again. So we would entertain it and, uh, Charlie would all, you know, the three of us owned the band. It belongs to all of us. So his his third ownership in, in the band was sort of, uh, you know, something, if he wanted it not to happen, it was sort of his right to say so, right? Um, and you kind of had to, like, respect that. So we did. And uh, finally, I think the McFly thing, what was so unique about it was when I showed up at the McFly show, just as a friend, you know, it was like I was just there because they're my friends. When they suggested I should go and play some songs acoustically, I didn't know that it was going to turn into, you know, <laughs> some like Susan Boyle moment. You know? <laughs> I, didn't, I, like, I didn't know it was going to be, you know, because that's what it was like. You know, it was like going out, you know, by myself and playing some songs that really I hadn't even had a chance to rehearse. It's just the only reason I knew how they went was because I had written them and I play them from time to time in my bedroom. So it wasn't like I prepared for that at all. And I didn't know it was going to go down that way. So with the excitement of that, the offer that Busted had was not Busted. It was to sing, but originally it was to sing Busted songs with McFly. So that was something that would have happened anyway like with or without the busted name that could have happened and i think that when i met with charlie uh he um you know he sort of understood that it what we were doing was something else and i said look even though it's not busted we still want to use the name you know we still want to you know everyone knows what busted is and everyone knows those songs and you know maybe we can come to an agreement and we did you know and um but he said that you know for the first time ever at that when i that, you know maybe maybe i'd think about doing it again but i'm not sure like you know uh how keen he was on the mcbusted thing because i think he was worried or maybe he thought that it you know would a lot of people didn't know, you know that's the truth like, a lot of people didn't know that mcbusted would work a lot of people thought that, um, and to be honest, I don't think, you know, when we made the album, I don't think it did work. I thought that, you know, I thought the two bands lost each, like, identity of each other. Like, um, touring, when we could, like, play each other's songs was amazing. It was, like, the most fun I've ever had on tour, right? Um, but when we made music together, it sort of felt like, 
I don't know. It just sort of felt like it wasn't a no brainer. Sort of felt like there were other questions that were unanswered or do you know what I mean? Yeah. By that. Just felt like there were some unanswered questions that we, you know, no one really stopped to think about because it was going so well. Um, but, you know, when Charlie said, you know, maybe if you wait a year, I'll do it with you. And I said, well, that's crazy because I would love to do. I would love to do Busted, you know, as Busted originally was. I would love to do that. And but I didn't want to stop what was happening with McFly because I had a connection with those songs too. So for me, like in some ways, touring with McFly and Busted together was sort of, um, in a way, uh, the ultimate way to come back because it was a celebration of everything. And, um, but sort of marketed around the absence of Busted because it was, you know, the thing that had been gone missing. And... It went so well that it kind of segued into Busted when the time was right. and Wild story, isn't it? Crazy. Don't you think it's a bit mental? Especially the fact that you had songwriting on McFly's debut album, no? Yeah, like, yeah. You were so heavily involved in both these projects, and now they came together, and it paved the way for the comeback. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. It was like the Stargate back to Busted was created in, like, 2004 or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was just formulating. Yeah. If that's but the you, word. But you could never have predicted. <laughs> no. Yeah. Hang on. I just got to restart the whole list. Yeah. So you guys broke up at the height. Busted broke up at the height of everything. Yeah, in 2005, January. What did that feel like for you? Because your songs, your creations were out there. People were loving it. And then you're suddenly being told you have to stop. So like... um. It was like January 14th, 2005. Three days before my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I remember like I left the press conference and there were three cars outside to take us home. And it was like, oh, it was so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, why are we talking about this? Do you want to skip it? Uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, what I'm saying is, is that... <laughs> I mean, look, it is, I guess it is interesting to talk about it. Um, but the thing that was, the thing that was so strange about that day is you're right. We were uh, sort of bringing the guillotine down on our band. And I didn't really understand it completely. Um I couldn't really make sense of what was going on because it was so strange. You know, we'd sort of accomplished everything more than what we would ever dream of, of doing. And it wasn't like it was slowing down. I mean, I, I actually believe that we would have conquered America. You know, we, we could have done that. You sold me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like we were starting to come out here and everything. It's just, you know, the song was going to radio. Um, we would we had a TV show on MTV, America or Busted. That How'd was, that do? It did well on MTV in England. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, that was our place. But in America, it wasn't on MTV, MTV, like, everyone knows it. It was on MTV2. Do you remember that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was on, um, it was on, like, MTV2. And, uh, but I would go, but when I went snowboarding the Christmas before the January broke up, people had, well, had seen me on the show. So it was like people in America, some people did see it. It wasn't as, uh, it didn't reach as many people as like normal MTV, but it did reach people, I think. Yeah. Um, but, uh, like it was actually like getting bigger. So... And when I got home from the press conference, I turned on the television and we were on it. You know, uh, the videos were still on the music channels and uh, our television show was still on MTV. And uh, it was really weird to sort of see that and go, but it's done. Do you know what I mean? What kind of press was there? saying how it was done where you had to end this now you're seeing everywhere it's over 
What does that do to you? Uh, did that it, affect you? Yeah, it just sort of felt like a big shame. It sort of felt like, oh, this is some weird uh, alternate Back to the Future reality, you know, where Biff got the got the time machine and changed the future for the worse. You know, it was like yeah, this. Um, but, you know, the press that we got around splitting up was because I, I don't know. I don't know if you uh, have any experience in this stuff, but bad news travels really fast and far oh yeah <laughs> like it just like goes so in a way the band sort of got more famous when we broke up that that month i mean it was everything you know there's the most press we'd ever had and uh the press conference that we did was like completely full up and they only had like a three days notice to like get people there but it was like a complete when we came out to sit down it was like you know a lot of people there and uh yeah it was like you know um i definitely felt like everyone knew when it happened you know in, well, in england right yeah what was your day-to-day -day like once that happened what did you do um so i just not a lot <laughs> just um i actually play grand theft auto three or vice city vice city great game i think it was vice city yeah um i think it was vice city and uh on the xbox and i was just i did that for about two months and you know like my, my i remember my phone was just it was non-stop uh, it was like it was like vibrating across the floor like just always like like you know when phones vibrate they kind of move yeah i just remember like i have a memory of like playing the grand theft auto and the phone is just <laughs> like it was one of those like sony flip phones yeah like the oval shaped type thing at the bottom yeah I remember it's going, you know, the phone's just like going. Yep. But, you know, I was also, it was weird because. Can you just bring it a little closer? Yeah, sorry. It was weird because um, I had like all this time. I had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> so people were like, why don't you go on holiday? But I was like, I can't go on holiday. I don't know what it is. I can't do, I should do that. But I can't do that. Because it, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel normal to go and sit on a beach somewhere. I felt like I had other things to do. And I, even though I was just in my apartment playing video games, it sort of felt like, um... It sort of felt like I had to stay in London for some reason, you know? Were you almost hoping maybe there'd be a call to come back? I just, no, I wasn't thinking that. I definitely I definitely knew that the band was finished. Um, but I knew that I wanted to keep recording, you know? And that was the birth of Son of Dork. Yeah. How, how quickly did you come to terms to create Son of Dork after that? kind of i mean kind of fast um because i i kept writing i kept kept like songwriting by yourself or with other people sometimes by myself sometimes with other people um it would depend i mean i'll write with anybody you know doesn't matter i'll, I'll I, i've written songs with people that have never written songs before like I'll write a song with someone that has no songwriting ability <laughs> and that will be the only song that that person will ever write. Yeah. But like, I actually kind of get a kick out of that. I like doing that. Um, so, but then I'll write songs with people who are incredible songwriters. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I, I quite like, um, I quite like the sport of songwriting. 
I wanted to ask yeah. you because you you do so much songwriting for other yeah. people. Yeah. Backstreet Boys, The Vamps, Five Sauce. Well, The Backstreet Boys actually never got released, but it did get recorded. That's what I want to ask. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems like you're so into the art of songwriting anyway. I was going to ask if it hurts you in a way that you put your darkest emotions, your deepest emotions into these songs and you can't release them. But it seems like you just love the process of the writing so much. Well, in a way, they're released when they're created, you know, because that song is released from you. It's not released into the system. It's not it, it's not gone through DistroKid, but it's released from you, you know? Yeah. Um, songs like come you know when when people who don't have that relationship with making music or creating songs they think of songs as songs they hear on spotify i've got songs that i've never recorded i have like a backed up traffic jam of songs in my mind that is like you know there's probably a thousand songs that i haven't recorded are you constantly just thinking of things are you thinking of songs right now no not right now, but I'm always thinking of songs. Like if I'm driving around or if I'm, you know, in a moment where I'm by myself, like I'm, 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 I'm never bored. You know, I'm kind of like keeps me, uh, keeps me thinking. Do you have to be in a happy state of mind to write a happy, happy poppy song? I think it helps, but I don't think you have to be because you could write a lyric that could be kind of dull and when you go to record it, you could be in a different mood and sometimes a happy production with a dull lyric might work. So um, you can, there's a lot of places, you know, that that can, songs can change shape at different, uh, different points in the process, you know. Uh, I mean, I definitely, I definitely easily come up with maybe two or three ideas a day, you know. And some of them won't be good. And some of them will never see the light of day. Most of them will never see the light of day because they, I just, I won't record them. Like I've never gone to the studio and thought I don't have anything to record, you know? You wrote the year 3000? Yeah. Do you mind sharing how the Jonas Brothers acquired that song? Yeah. Uh, so, well, so it was a hit for Busted. And when Busted ended, so a lot of, there are a lot of people in the music business who are transatlantic people, executives who are in London and they're in New York, right? And there was this guy, Dave Massey, who when we showcased for Sony in London, he was there, but he, in the time since Busted had happened, he was in New York. And in 2006, he called me randomly. And the phone call just came in and I picked up and it was, it was Dave Massey. And he was asking if, you know, I knew Nick Jonas from before because he'd recorded a song of mine before when he was a lot younger. Uh, I think he did like a Christian record. And, um, Dave was like, can we record Year 3000 with the Jonas Brothers? Because Nick's going to do, we're going to do a thing with his brothers. We're going to put them together sort of like in a busted kind of way. And I was like, yeah, I don't think you need my permission to do that. Because you don't need permission to sing someone's song, right? Right. So he said, yeah, well, we want to like put it on Radio Disney. And Radio Disney don't want to say she's pretty fine. And they, there's a couple of other things that just they want to change. Triple-breasted women. Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't want to stop it from happening. And I don't want to stop you from doing the song. But I also don't really want to go and rewrite the song either because I like it the way it is. But if you can figure out what works for those things, maybe you just do that. But no publishing because the song's already... You know, the song's the song. Anyone can, like, change out a couple words, you know. Um, so I didn't think I would ever hear about it ever again. 
and then it happened. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. So you have the publishing for that version as well? Yeah, the publishing's the publishing. And and you know, that doesn't change. Publishing is like land and the recorded music is like a house on the land. So when they recorded the song, it's their record, it's their master, but it's our land. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So interesting. And then the song blew up. You guys just did Year 3000 2.0, where you featured the Jonas Brothers on it. Yeah, we had to do that. You know, we were doing this cool idea where people were featuring on our songs. And obviously, some people are easier to get than others. And Jonas Brothers are probably at the top of that get list. And we thought, look, if, you know, we're going to look really lame if we do this features album and we can't get the Jonas Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we have all this like crazy, we have this crazy, we're, we're sort of connected through this song. And, um, you know, we had all these artists like celebrating the 20 year anniversary and, and, um, but the thing is the Jonas Brothers are just very, um, they're really classy people and they're really, you know, they're very, um, they're very gracious and you know they wear their success really well and they were just really cool about it and made it happen that's sick yeah your 20th uh, anniversary album featuring all those artists is such a cool idea i haven't seen it from anyone else but you have such I, yeah I, I i when we first spoke about it i was thinking we're never gonna be able to do that to get those people yeah, you would never like because because how do you ar even arrange that organize that and also 11 months ago none of this was even on the cards <laughs> no comeback no like <laughs> like 11 months ago actually i thought the band was finished 11 months ago i didn't think i we spoke about doing something else because our last thing was before the pandemic and um, there was no sign of any of this stuff, so I don't know how the hell it happened. But you know, the you know, it wasn't my idea to do this. I mean, do I think it's a great idea? Yeah, like I probably would have suggested it if I thought it was possible. But I think uh, you know, we went back with our original manager, and he suggested it. And when he suggested it. I was like, it's a great pipe dream. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all time low, simple plan, neck deep, Jonas Brothers. Yeah. The list is insane. Bowling for Soup, <sighs> Wheatus, James Arthur. Yeah, it's um, You Me at Six, Death of Anna. I mean, yeah, it's like, it's a real like, it's a really like incredible list of uh, people. I, I, you know, yeah. I And I think that what was weird about it I think even if any member of Busted had said it, it wouldn't have happened. I don't think that any of us believe that any of us uh, could could make that happen. Like, the fact that our manager said it, and I was like, yeah, that's that's definitely a big thing, but maybe if each member of the band focused on three people... <laughs> 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 like, like, trying to like that's a lot of emails yeah. it's a lot of chasing it's a lot of like getting like people to like agree and even when they agree like we got people to agree and then they change their minds i mean that list is really good but it could have been much worse but it could have been much it could have it, we were going like we were aiming like for the stars can you, you know? share anyone's names you were aiming for well yeah we were speaking to um well, no, I don't, I don't, you know, because I don't, yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to like people to think that there's any, um, any bad blood or anything. Cause there isn't, uh, but, um, but no, we were like, you know, we were talking to, we, we were talking about some insane stuff and, um, you know, thankfully, I mean, when, when an act like the Jonas brothers or people like Jane, people that have like, you know, 25, 30 million monthly listeners on Spotify are saying, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're like amazing, you know. I know you're a massive Michael Jackson fan. Yeah. Was is there any thought of having like a recorded track from him on one of your songs? Well, I, I mean, I I mean, I I don't know. I think that um, we would never think of him because uh, 
he's not he's not alive but uh people are doing this thing with ai now where they're just sort of like you know but i don't know i i think that um i think what we wanted to do is we wanted to reach out to people that we felt like actually made made sense um but people that don't make sense probably are even better do you know what i mean like i mean that would be stupid to uh even just to get some sounds you know even if he came to the studio for a day and just made those noises you know if he was alive that would be funny you know or like different i think people like people just want to hear like different stuff now they want you know and they don't mind if it's like a song that they like if they can hear a different version of it they'll they'll stream it or they'll listen to it it's weird because i will always want to go after new new songs i the the thrill of like making new music is sort of outweighs this stuff for me there was there's there was sort of like a like a feeling when we were doing the re-records where i was like is that is that better you know should i care um and it's you know a lot of the songs you know they sound different sometimes it's like oh i prefer that about the original but i prefer that about the new one you know but um we spoke about you know some really really stupid stuff i mean we never actually even asked her but we have a song on our first album called britney and we were going to do britney feet britney that'd be sick yeah yeah we, we we wanted to do that but we didn't i don't think we even ended up asking her um because uh we were so swamped with the people we were asking and if it was going to happen and yeah, it was, let's just say it was a lot of like, I, I think if people will probably see that and they'll probably attempt to do it and they're going to just, it's like thousands of emails chasing because no one that's doing it. It's not when you're trying to get people to do something that isn't on their radar or on their agenda it's often harder to make those things happen right so you guys have an arena tour coming up now yeah how many dates is it um 27 are you beyond thrilled to get back on the road yes do you guys all share a bus yes do you have those do you think it'll be those same memories as when you guys went out 20 years ago no <laughs> how, how is it different it's just different <laughs> Is it more calm down in a way? Yeah, it's calm down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the bus like 20 years ago? Um, hectic. I would bring people on tour that I'd meet on holiday, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they would know nothing about the band. Yeah. I would meet them snowboarding. <laughs> And I'd be like, you want to come and see my band play? But like, yeah, yeah, come come on the bus. And they would, and they, they would get to England and they would scratch their head and they would be like, wait, are you opening up for anyone or is this your show? <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny. Because I would not be allowed to snow. If we had a tour coming up in like, you know, March, at Christmas, I'm not allowed to snowboard. So I wasn't allowed to take my little brother on all of the dangerous snowboarding slopes and there was this guy getting on the you know guy looked like my age total like snowboarder i was like can you go up with him because i can't and he went up with him and i made friends with him i was like yeah come come on tour and he did like so there would be always like maybe four or five people like that that are just kind of on the road you know that want to just you know go to the parties afterwards you know yeah so yeah it's definitely not as hectic anymore um i'm sure it'll be fun there's always some something funny that happens you know can you see what do you see for after the tour any plans of more new music yeah uh definitely yeah more music Son of Dorker Union? You know, it's really funny because <laughs> it's been like 20 years. It's, we're, it's time. <laughs> and I, you know, I think for the hundred people that would like it, it would be really fun. On behalf of them, yes. Yeah. 
Because maybe there's a hundred people that want to see that. I think there's way more. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the number is? I think it's a hundred. Oh, I think it's way higher. I think you're underestimating it. <laughs> what do you think? 40,000? No. I think... No, you're, 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 you're... That's not true. I really do. No. I really I do. I completely, completely disagree with you. Those songs were so special. I cannot imagine that there is that kind of numbers of people that would care. I also feel like you. it's one thing... It's one thing thinking about the hundred people that care. It's another thing. And that, by the way, those hundred people, they're all scattered everywhere. So reaching them all at the same time is really hard. I don't probably think they probably don't even all follow me on Instagram. Those hundred people. You know what I mean? I mean, I will say like there has been the most weirdest times where people have said, I love your band. And, you know, it's like one in a hundred people they surprise me and they say son of dork and they don't say busted and i'm always really surprised when that happens because i don't think about it at all um but it's odd because son of dork really is the beginning of loserville which was the musical that I, you know has done so well around the world um this year like the loserville musical you know it sold 60,000 tickets in japan wow and i went to that I was flown out by the producers and I went to Tokyo and I walked into a sold out theater that was being sold out twice a day. 1500 people in a, in a big, you know, it wasn't small. It was big. And I watched my musical in Japanese translated the songs, the lines that people say, like all Japanese. I didn't understand a word of it, but I kind of knew what was happening because I know what's happening, but you know, a lot of bands that have musicals spawned from the bands, you know, uh, the bands that kind of have that, it's like queen or meatloaf or, you know, the who it's always, there's like big, like classic rock bands that kind of tend to cross over into like the musical uh world but then again you've got abba did really well with it but the fact that i think we're the only punk pop band that has fans in that thing that have a musical that's done that well i mean which is crazy yeah it is a crazy story that's a, that's its own thing that's like a that's like its own podcast i know i want to ask you so much but i don't want to take up yeah. so much of your time yeah but um yeah the son of dork thing the son of dork thing i um i will show you something okay yeah um and this is just a pipe dream okay because i always thinking of things and i'm always coming up with ideas oh wow wow if there was going to be an album. That's sick. <laughs> I mean, I just thought it was like, if I don't know, it will happen, but I've definitely got more than enough songs for it. I would know. I think I have probably 20 to 30 solid, like pop punk son of dork style songs to like choose from for that. If I was going to do that, but everything's so full on everything's so busy and and busted is like on fire so but i don't know cool i'm not gonna you know if if, if busted went away tomorrow maybe you know but i'm quite happy doing busted so are we <laughs> <laughs> james thanks so much for being here yeah very excited having... very excited for everything with you everyone is it this tour sold out so people can't even get tickets the tour sold out, but we added extra dates um, on top of the extra dates. So I feel like if you're really trying to go, go to the end of the yeah. tour. Yeah. Any plans to come to America and play, the three of you? <sighs> no plans right now, but um, I think that um, it'd be fun. I just don't know.
Thanks so much for being here, James. Lightweights, out. Thank you. That Thank was you. great.